I want to tell you what this presentation is going to be because it's not going to have any charts or statistics or any descriptions of general tendencies at all. My work is that I work with people and I work really hard to try to help them get their lives better. But it turns out that the very things that most people really need to do to get their lives better are also the exact same things that are good for the environment and that these two things are incredibly linked. They are linked around the concept of what I call dissociation, but if you want to think of it more, you know, in local language, say disconnection. And I think that most of the time people's problems arise from the fact that they are very disconnected from their environments, and that is also the problem that we're having around the issue of climate change and why we're having such a hard time getting people to be responsive to what's going on. What you're going to see here is lots of the, of the material that I've got. What I do is I interview people. I talk to people for a long time, an hour, an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. And I listen to them very carefully. I write down everything they say, and then I kind of put it together. And I try to look for tendencies, but mostly I'm paying very close attention to what people are experiencing and seeing what I can learn from the ground, like where people live, where their hearts are, where their souls are, where their ideas are. And that's the material that you're going to see here today. Um, so I want to start with the uh, concept of connection and being connection. I believe that my, my work with children will tell me that kids start out very connected to their environments. And most kids are environmentalists, for the most part. Um, OK, so everything is connected. This is Greg Bailey, who is a forest ranger in Denali National Park. And this is the polychrome ridge. And that's where I interviewed him. And he explained to me that what's really going on in life is that all pieces of life are interdependent, interconnected. That's not going to be news to anybody here. He also talks about the fact that um, people are spatial, as are bears. And he explains that if you disrupt people's spaces, then there's going to be problems with, for bears and for people. He also said that when you disrupt people's relationship to the land, they go crazy, just like bears. And he talks a lot about what has happened to bears and what, what they're doing with bears in Denali. As it turns out, that is a psychological, those are psychological ideas. And I took Ranger Bailey's words, and I wrote a paper about it, and tried to develop a, seri a theory of psychology where we think about the physical environment as as important a relationship as one you have to the people in your life. It's there, and you know it when you're a child, and you unlearn it. Um, do landscapes form who we are? This is um, a gentleman that I interviewed who is a Navajo, and this is Canyon Deshay, and he grew up here. And he lived here for the first 12 years of his life. And when he was 12 years old, he came up. And it's a whole thing when you come up. And he is also an environmentalist. And he also knows strongly about what it means to live and be connected to the earth. Um, oops. I lived at the bottom of this canyon until I was 12. This place was all I knew. I roamed here learning every bit of the canyon. It was part of me. I knew that there was life up there. And many people came and went, but I stayed down until then. We understand that you will become the place that you live. So this is how we do it. Now I live on the outside, and I come here to visit, but the person I am is still like the inside of the canyon. So there it is, the idea that the place, the space, the physical environment is a part of you. OK, interviewing people born before 1960. Um, this woman was probably 85 years old. And I remember the milk being delivered from the farm, came in a truck, and we had to get it into the ice box, a real ice box, right? A box with ice in it. The cream was still on top, and you knew that what you were drinking was somehow connected to life. Another person as a child, I ran around all the time playing, creating, using the environment as part of my intelligence. Then you gradually get used to its being taken away. And you go along with it, because you know it hurts, only that feels a little crazy, so that also goes away. So that's a person describing that, that moment of disconnect, when suddenly you stop thinking, believing, relating to the earth as though it's important. And that's what you get, the culture of entitlement. <laughs> so um, a lot of the young people that I interview, right, it's a lot of times they're, they're, they mean well. They've all gone on adventure trips. 
um, that, you know, in high school, whatever. Um, they do volunteer work. They're, you know, philanthropically involved, especially as uh, in the getting into college process. Um, you know, their minds are in the right place, but their orientation is uh, particularly narcissistic, and I mean that just in the sort of colloquial use of the word, kind of self-involved, very materialistic. It's a kind of me-centered culture. There's a lot of, you know, excessive drinking. These are the kids that you see. They get wasted all the time. And it's like really fun. Everybody blacks out, and then there's all this hooking up, and there's an entire culture around this, and it's like how a lot of young people relate right now. This is called just being a kid, and they don't see Right, that there's an expression of something else. And what I did in a paper that I wrote about this was to talk about how what these kids are saying to us is, this is how you treat the earth. So this is how I act, and these are my values, and this is how I behave. You use the earth, well, that's what we've learned. We use each other. And that's considered to be kind of a norm. And if you sit and talk with these kids, they tell you some really interesting things about how they uh, expect their lives to be lived. And they don't really have a sense of what we've been talking about earlier in the conference, going, going from me to we. Um, these kids will say things like this. Well, my only vacations have been to Las Vegas. I have never gone hiking or to the outdoors. What is there to do there? I like the fact that winter is warmer, except that it messes up my skiing. It was so weird to join a CSA and realize that your food actually comes from somewhere. I like looking at nature, but I wouldn't ever want to be in it. There's so many bugs and creatures. Yuck. Um, so the question for me is how, how in, in this, when people are thinking in, a, in an orientation that's so organized around their things and their technology and their acting on their impulses and immediate gratification. And that's what they know, and that's what they've come to know of life. And remember, kids born after 1916 are a television generation. This is what they have come to know. How do you try to talk to them about sustainability, especially when everybody's falling around the dollar? You know, trying to think about how they're gonna earn money, how are they gonna be successful? This is just the definition of one person, um, a psycho psychologist, psychiatrist, who wrote about um, this kind of dissociation where there's a disconnect, okay? And um, he's seeing that the disconnect between humans and the environment is toxic, not just for our culture and our planet, but for people. And there's a, a book by Richard Louvre, everybody knows this book, Last Child in the Woods. Okay, he's written about and talked about how so many psychiatric diagnoses that at least in part you can see a connection to changes in the way kids are relating to their physical spaces and to their ecosystems. Okay, and it helped, a series of interviews, and I guess I can, if anyone wants to see the interviews, I have a couple copies. Here's, can you look at that? There, I mean, they're just lots of questions. This is what they look, have looked like. Um, what I found was, as I put together all these different interviews, there's three categories. Um, summarized by this quote, I spend more time at the mall than being outdoors. This is a person who grew up and lived in a very, very beautiful part of the world, lots of mountains, never went to the mountains, only went to the mall. And I think, and that, and her, and consequently her relationship to the environment is more of a scenery model. And then there's this middle category. I run the environmental committee at my synagogue, but I haven't had much to do with the environment other than nice vacations and the work I do on email campaigns. So the environment is actually kind of a symbol, like it's this thing that you relate to because you want to be identified with its meaning. The thing that I'm really, it's most interesting to us here is this guy. He went to the mountain school. I didn't see how things worked. I was a part of how they worked. The mountain school is a semester program that's offered in New Hampshire where you can go and you basically work and live on a farm while you're going to school. And you take care of the animals. You, you, all your food, you, may, you plant, harvest, and cook on your own. And because of that, this guy was transformed. That's what I'm interested in. Like, How do you get from the entitled culture to 
somebody who says, you know what, this planet, the ecosystem that I'm a part of, it's a part of me. I, and that, therefore, it's meaningful. And therefore, all the little psychological transformations that we talked about earlier become possible because you're not just relating to an object which can then be abused. You're relating, it's a relationship to something that you have to you know, interact with and compromise. Um, I call this the psychological turn in the environmental movement. Um, and this is the same guy who went to the mountain school who is now an investment banker and who actually has taken on the work of trying to um, develop business strategy around green markets. The changes will be and have to be very intense and bigger than we are prepared for. It will become a psychological problem as much as it will be economic, geological, and biological and otherwise. The battle will partly be in our heads. I think if I allow myself to know this relationship to my ecosystem, I would be a different person. Are any of us ready for that? So the next, the next thing that I did with this is that I started teaching a class on child wellness and ecological sustainability. And you can, uh, this is what the syllabus looks like. It's way too complicated to try to get into it here. But when I first started teaching the class, they said, when you say the environment, do you mean like the environment, like the physical planet? I mean, they were shocked. They couldn't understand like what I was talking about. Okay. okay. And how does a person have a relationship to the environment? They didn't know I have relationships to people, to pl not places. So what I had them do for the class is to do something called an environmental autobiography. And there was, they had to tell their life story through their relationship to their ecosystems, whether they were rural, urban, et cetera. And out of that came a sudden realization. People who thought that they had no connection to an ecosystem of any kind suddenly were very aware that, indeed, look at this. You know, when you asked me to write this, I started to remember that my relationship to a favorite tree and realize that the relationship has been with me forever, how meaningful, um, coming to understand that landscapes are part of who I am, having a relationship to the earth limits me, makes me think, puts boundaries around me that contain me. And a lot of ideas in those quotes, but the, um, one of the important things here is that also people are losing environmental knowledge, much in the same way that uh, animals that are industrial farms lose their maternal and foraging skills. People are l losing the memories of what it meant to have a connected relationship to the environment. You can still see it in people who are older, pre-1960, but after that, it's very, very hard for people to really know what you're talking about because they've been raised in such material environments that it doesn't make sense to them. They're disconnected from it. And so the kinds of things that are going to help are engaging creative artists. The movie that everyone saw, Avatar, right? That made a big difference for people. They emotionally experienced it. Experiencing kids to experiential relationship with the environments, like the AMC. The food movement has been excellent. And also looking at, you know, because people are getting in touch with food and farms. And finally, the psychological ethnographic turn, getting people to reconnect at a sensory level to a relationship with their e ecosystem, getting people to recognize that this whole relationship that they've had to an ecosystem is valid, ask them to connect to it, to reflect upon it, it will help change how they will interact with that environment. Um, and it's important that you're doing this through the senses, that it's sensory. It's intellectual. And this is one of the things that you'll see. People will take surveys. They'll fill out forms. They'll go to workshops. They will go home, and they will not change. Intellectually, they know, but they have to know it emotionally. And so a lot of what we can try to do if we want to make a difference is communicate in a way that people can feel it. There's a sadness in my heart when I think about the places I've been and the places I come from, and I don't know them. I feel like I want to know them as though they should be part of me and all of us. Otherwise, we are just mechanical beings, parts of our technology. But this is something only feelings can bring you out of. You can know it, but if you can't feel it, it won't become real. Thank you.